grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. St. Paul writes, dear brothers in the ministry, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not man's gospel that Paul is preaching. How could it be? How could it be anything other than a divine revelation? An apocalypse is the word in Greek that could have brought Paul out of the darkness of Judaism. What else other than a divine gospel could have brought Paul to his knees and made him, the Pharisee, receive baptism from Ananias? And I rather think that food that strengthens him, probably the life-giving food of the Eucharist. The one who met Paul on the Damascus road is more than a man. It's a divine gospel that he gives to him. And Paul recognizes this even before he quite knows who it is because he calls him Lord. He says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And who else other than the Lord could have opened Paul's eyes and given him that great insight to read the Old Testament? Now, no longer is something relating to the traditions of his fathers, but to Christ himself. And it's such that when Paul's eyes are open, that he goes into the synagogue in Damascus, and the only thing that he has to say of Jesus of Nazareth now is that he is the Son of God. Now, Paul learns everything about the Son of God from the Son himself. And Paul has the distinction that he is not even catechized by the apostles, which I rather think, especially when you read about his relationship with Peter, I think it gives Paul a little bit of swagger. And it always reminds me of an old saying that I try to live by, which is, you can't be arrogant if you know what you're talking about. So I think about that. So he's not catechized by the apostles. And yet when Paul returns and he goes to Jerusalem after the three years in Damascus, uh, it does seem that there's a kind of friendly, amicable, theological interview with Peter and James. But other than that, St. Paul is not taught by mere men. He receives everything through an apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Now today is the second of three consecutive feast days that honor the great pastors of the earliest church. So yesterday, January the 24th, St. Timothy's Day, so happy name day to me. And then today is the conversion of Paul, and then tomorrow the 26th is St. Titus. And I think that it's fitting that we have a pastoral feast today at a meeting of the brethren, we who stand in succession to Paul and Timothy and Titus, and we who share in their apostolic ministry. We are entrusted with the same gospel as Paul. And this reveals something about you and me, actually. We who are called and ordained servants of the word. As with Paul, it's not man's gospel that we're entrusted with. It's God's. Now, being your younger brother in the ministry, I do feel a little sheepish sharing with you the insights that I've gleaned from Paul in my whopping one and a half years in the ministry. But... I have gained a little bit, all right? And maybe we can compare notes and we can see if Paul's ministry has been as instructive for you the way that it has for me. When the hands were laid on me, there were two tropes that I wanted to avoid. The first trope was, I did not want to be Herr Pastor, the German autocrat who comes into his congregation straight from the seminary and he's swinging the incense and taking names. Didn't want to be that. And on the other hand, because I think this is more common, I didn't want to be the guy who is sweet and deferential to a fault. A milk toast kind of guy who walks on eggshells around this Grandma Schmidt who doesn't really exist and who doesn't know how to excuse himself from a lady's tea. I did not want to be that guy either. Neither of those models of ministry really appeals to me. And I think that the apostolic model for ministry is actually somewhere in between. There are actually many tensions that exist in the ministry. 
This is something that we learn from St. Paul. Because on the one hand, St. Paul says that the pastor is not to be quarrelsome. He is to be gentle. But on the other hand, he says that the pastor is to be able to teach. And that would indicate to me that being in the ministry requires a little bit of a spine. And it requires a little bit of a spine because you're not just some egghead teaching a lecture and then you never have to bear the consequences of the things that you teach. But you have to have a little bit of a spine. I've learned, you know this already, but I've learned this in my time in the ministry because it takes a little bit of a spine to explain the full counsel of God to people. And the full counsel of God for many of our sheep though they're beloved by God, is unnatural and it's uncomfortable because they're not immersed in God's word the way that you and I are. So it takes a little bit of a spine and also a little bit of gentleness and respect when Grandma Schmidt's sister, Methodist Marge, comes to visit and you have to kindly explain why you can't commune her. It takes both of those things. And Paul, I think, is instructive for having a little bit of a spine because he opposes Peter to his face. And, of course, you know the office that Peter holds in the church, right? He's the first. The old joke was he's the first pope. But I was going to say he's the first synod president. <laughs> now, that's, that's the, uh, the certain tension that we have in the qualifications. The rub comes in. Because, as Paul says, it's not man's gospel. It's Jesus' gospel. I am God's man in this place. And so when you speak, it says, St. Peter says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And yet, even though we have this authority, the pastor is among us as one who serves. So we're servants which you know means that it's not about you, it's not about me, and it's also not about the people. It's about Jesus. It's Jesus' gospel. That is the only gospel that have, could have made the Pharisee of Tarsus into the apostle to the Gentiles. And I would just say, brothers, that he is concerned with the gospel. And what I mean is, you notice that Jesus doesn't knock Paul off of his horse and blind him just to leave him condemned. That Jesus does these things to Paul in order to baptize him and to set him apart for the ministry and to have him share in his own sufferings in order that, as Paul writes in Philippians, that I may attain the resurrection of the dead. So it takes boldness not only to proclaim the law, it actually takes boldness to proclaim the gospel. And thus we act and we speak like Paul, as one having authority. And the hair pastor in me needs to be reminded that authority is not the ability to do something. That's called power. But the sweet, deferential ministry of presence guy in me needs to be reminded that authority means authorization, that I have it from God to administer the sacraments, and to preach the word. And the church has entrusted this to me through a rightly ordered call. So tell the truth. That's what we're called to do. Now, one other thing that I've learned from Paul when it comes to the tensions of, in the ministry is what it means for the pastor to be a servant. And you learn this, I think, fairly early on. Uh, people do notice this. They notice when they're putting out the garbage bags after coffee hour. And you're like, oh, I'll take that. You know, I can walk to the dumpster. They notice when you help set up chairs. I understand all that. That's not what Paul means, though. When Paul talks about servanthood, the question that you have to ask is, all right, so we're servants. Whose servants are we? You know the conventional answer. Servants of the people, the members. Not true. Because Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that he is an apostle. He is a sent one, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And he says further in Galatians, 
For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I learned from Paul that I'm not here to please anybody. I'm here to please Christ. And I only defer to him when it comes to the word. Now, I serve the people in this place, but you know how you serve them? is by serving Christ and doing what he says. And brothers, I can tell you that my biggest mistakes in the ministry in that one and a half years, but I've also come to find the biggest mistakes that I've made in every other area of my life have come when I forget who I am to please. And when I fear the displeasure, because that's as bad as it usually gets, we have it pretty easy, but I fear the displeasure of men more than I fear the Lord who called me. So be a man and be God's man. And when I feel the temptation to act like less than a man of God. There's always a question that haunts me. I never can get it out of my mind. I think about it on the good days too, but it's especially when I feel as I mess up. And the question is, if they don't hear the truth from you, who are they going to hear it from? I think we have work to do. And you feel the tension? I'm sure you do. All the time. And I do too. And there's something else about that tension is that it lets us know that the ministry really is God's work. And that's something that we say all the time, you know, and it's become the status of a cliche, but it really is true that all the work is God's. And just one other thing about that. Don't get a big head about this. But you know that you and I are the answers to somebody's prayers. And there was a time, time, a point, when there were congregations in northern Michigan that were praying that a laborer would be sent to their little corner of the harvest. And in response, God sent you and me. How about that? And the same is true of the apostle. You realize that all the things that Paul did, that he traveled to the end of the Roman world, his goal was to get to Spain. Uh, but that he writes much of the New Testament, that he's the apostle to the Gentiles, that he stands before Agrippa and eventually Nero and all of these things, you realize that the, Paul's entire ministry is the answer to the prayer of one man in particular. And that was St. Stephen. Because with his dying breath, Stephen prayed, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And God answered that prayer because he forgave Saul of Tarsus. Because Saul was standing there on the precipice and he was giving his approval to St. Stephen's execution. And that mantle that Stephen laid down was picked up by Paul. Didn't know it at the time, but it was picked up by Paul because Paul is called by the gospel. And God called you. God prepared you. God ordained you. And you continually study to show yourself approved. And it's in this way that God fulfills his declaration to us when he says, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So, if it's God's gospel we are to proclaim, then let's do it in God's power. And so, you are God's man. You're entrusted with God's gospel and therefore preach the word. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So keep preaching the word and pray for me as I do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.